Welcome to Days of Roar, a Detroit Tiger podcast brought to you by the Detroit Free Press. My name is Mark Gorosh. I am here with Free Press beat writer Evan Petzold to recap maybe one of the more fun weeks of the entire season. Lots of comeback wins, lots of traveling, played a game in Williamsport, lots of winning. Evan, recap all the fun stuff for us. Yeah, Mark, it was probably the best week of the season. Definitely the most fun week of the season with all the promotions and the call-ups. And again, playing a game in Williamsport is always pretty sweet. But the Tigers went 5-1 and one with three one-run wins. They also had a one-run win last Sunday. So that's six wins in the past seven games with four one-run wins during the hot streak. They went 3-0 and against the Seattle Mariners at Comerica Park, and then 2-1 and against the New York Yankees at Comerica Park as well. They also played the one game at Journey Bank Ballpark at Historic Bowman Field in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. That was a Sunday night game on ESPN. Only about 2,500 fans in attendance. Most of them were Little League players for the Little League World Series, which ends next Sunday. Let's talk about that game. Parker Meadows, he had a walk-off single in the bottom of the 10th inning for a 3-2 win with the Tigers scoring all three runs in the final two innings. Newcomer Jace Young, the younger brother of Texas Rangers third baseman Josh Young, sent the game to extra innings with an RBI single off Clay Holmes. With two outs, he was down to his final two strikes, snuck a ball through the infield, scored the runner, sent the game to extra innings. The Yankees, though, they answered back in the top of the 10th, taking a 2-1 lead. Then the Tigers responded in the bottom of the 10th. Pinch hitter Zach McKinstry, he delivers an RBI single. Then Meadows back to the plate. RBI single ends up, you know, yeah, like, like, look, Parker Meadows had the RBI single, but before that happened, McKinstry stole second base. It was a perfect slide. It was beautiful. That ultimately allowed him to score on the single from Meadows. There was a really aggressive send from third base coach Joey Cora, the left fielder, kind of double clutch. Wouldn't a double clutch Jason Dominguez out there probably would have been able to throw out Zach McKinstry at the plate. He double clutched and it was still pretty close, but Zach McKinstry got in there. He scored game winning run. That's how it ended in the Little League Classic. Tarek Skubal also pitched in that game. He threw six innings of one run ball, lowered his ERA to 2.49 through 25 starts. He is officially running away with the American League Cy Young Award. He is far and away the best pitcher in baseball. He leads MLB with 14 wins and a 2.49 ERA. He also leads the AL in strikeouts with 185. That's how the Tigers capped off a 5 1 week. Pretty fun team right now. Seems like a lot of reasons to be cautiously optimistic, both for the immediate future and for the long-term future. Now, look, it's too late for the Tigers. Technically, it's not too late, but the odds to make the postseason for the first time since 2014, 1.1%, according to Fangraph. So, yes, there is still a 1.1% chance the Tigers advance the playoffs. But this time last week, Mark, the odds were just 0.3%. Tigers are 11 and a half games back in the AL Central, eight and a half games back of the final spot in the AL Wild Card. You got teams like the Boston Red Sox, Seattle Mariners, Tampa Bay Rays ahead of the Tigers in the AL standings, but still not in the playoffs. As for the AL Central, there are three teams currently in the postseason picture, Cleveland Guardians, Minnesota Twins, and Kansas City Royals. The Tigers still have a lot of work to do. It's probably too late based on the 1.1% odds, but man, this team is a lot of fun right now. And like I said, a lot of reasons to be cautiously optimistic, both for the immediate future and for the long-term future. I-, I like where the lineup is at right now. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, just a ton of fun this week. I mean, so many come be- come from behind victories, a Javi Baez blast to win a game, a bunch of comebacks against Seattle, pretty much the worst offense you could ever watch for seven innings of almost every game this week, aside from Saturday. And somehow... Waking from the slumber for graded bats in the eighth and ninth inning. So many times I've lost count. Last night, got to love the Jace Young at bat. Very solid, great approach. Colt Keith with three phenomenal swings last night, taking the ball the opposite way, as uh, Eno Saris had begged him to do when he met up up with him in San Francisco to do more. And uh, then just, you know, what a week from Parker Meadows. What a revelation. What a difference maker in the field, on the bases, and especially at the plate. 
making things happen. Totally different baseball team when he plays. And that shows up in the standings too, Mark, because the Tigers have a 30 and 17 record in games Parker Meadows has played this season. Also, since he's come back from AAA Toledo back in early July, and I know he missed, you know, basically a month with the hamstring injury. But since he came back from AAA Toledo, it's a 12 and 3 record in 15 games since he came back from Toledo. He is a difference maker, both on the field and when you look at what they're doing in the standings and what they're doing in the final result of the game. When Parker Meadows plays, the Tigers win. Yeah, look, he's he's got a 170 WRC plus since he was recalled and started playing on July 5th. It's pretty amazing stuff, to say the least. Just line drive after line drive after line drive, gap after gap after gap, not much cheap stuff. The weirdest thing is you and I are both very, very high on him. We discussed this all winter, what a difference maker he could be. And one of the best parts of his game is he can draw walks, and he's drawn almost no walks since July 5th, which is highly unusual for him. But I don't think there's much question that he will begin to draw walks. And uh, when that happens, I'm sure he'll cool off a little bit at the plate. But, yeah, big part of his game, a lot of stolen bases, got six steals since July 5th. And it's a dimension that uh, the Detroit Tigers do not have, considering their stolen base leader on the season. Zach Kinstry with nine. So, (laughs) yeah, we could go on and on about Parker Meadows. All right, let's get to the big two. Question one of the big two. After a lot of roster moves, does a good finish to the 2024 season mean anything for the 2025 season? So yes and no for me, but first I'm going to read the lineup from Sunday's game against the Yankees in the Little League Classic. Parker Meadows in center field, Riley Green at DH, Matt Veerling in left field, Kerry Carpenter in right field, Colt Keith at second base, Spencer Torkelson at first base, Jace Young at third base, Trey Sweeney at shortstop, Jake Rogers at catcher, Tarek Skubal on the mound, Don't forget about Dylan Dingler, the other catcher who's on the bench. A lot of promise there for him, both defensively and hopefully offensively. We'll see if he can contribute on the offensive side of the ball in the big leagues. The names that I just listed, I mean, that's a lot of young players, first and foremost. That's a lot of players with potential. You look at what Riley Green is and can can continue to become, what Kerry Carpenter can be, what Colt Keefe can be, Spencer Torkelson, the raw power is there. Is he ever going to put it together? I don't think so, but you never know. Jace Young, there's potential there. Trey Sweeney. You know, we'll see what he is, but like a lot of young players, a lot of reasons to like what the Tigers are rolling out there day in and day out. They're going to find out a lot about what they have moving forward in the final six weeks of the season. That, and it, look, if you finish strong, it always feels good. Okay. So that's my yes to this yes and no answer. The no is that the Tigers had a 29 and 21 record in their final 50 games last season, also an eight and three record in their final 11 games last season. And did what happened at the end of last season actually have any impact? on what happened in the offseason or in 2024 this season? No, not really. Like maybe it gave the com- the Tigers some additional confidence in Reese Olsen. Maybe it gave him an extra vote of confidence from Parker Meadows on the opening day roster. But like winning games when the season is already over doesn't do a whole lot. And the Tigers finished last season with a 78 and 84 record. Now, the yes portion of this comes down to individuals. And, and I think the only reason that, you know, a strong finish turns into a yes, it's really important, is if it changes the plan. So let's say Jace Young rakes, and I mean absolutely rakes. Let's say the underlying metrics are great. Let's say the back of the baseball card is great. Let's say he shows a decent ability to play third base. Maybe the Tigers then consider him as the opening day third baseman next year. Will those things happen? I don't think so, because I don't think Jace Young is a good third, third baseman. I think there are some flaws in his game on offense. But if those things do happen, they could impact the decision making or at least play a part in the conversation surrounding the third base position going into next season. The same is true for Spencer Torkelson, right? What he does down the stretch ultimately will impact how the Tigers prepare for the first base position going into 2025 and beyond. Is Torkelson going to be the guy? If he is, what contingency plan are they going to have in place in case he falls apart? Does Cole Keith pick up the first base glove this offseason? Or does somebody like Justin Henry Malloy pick up the glove over the offseason? As for that contingency plan I'm talking about, in 2025, do the Tigers go out and they get a Keston Hura type player again? Or do they sign a Carlos Santana type of player? I think to answer those questions, in part, it all depends on what the Tigers see from Torkelson down the stretch. Same is true for a guy like Trey Sweeney. Can he be the starting shortstop against right-handed pitching in 2025? He's bad against left-handed pitchers. But as for starting against righties, we'll see what he's got in the final six weeks. I think a good finish matters a lot more for specific individuals rather than for the entire team. Like, 
if Riley Green, Kerry Carpenter, and Cole Keith, if they suck down the stretch, am I going to be worried about them? No. But if Torkelson, you know, absolutely sucks and is no good down the stretch, am I going to write him off? You better believe it. And are the Tigers probably going to write him off? Yeah, maybe. That contingency plan might look a lot more like Carlos Santana than Keston Hira again. If Jace Young crushes, am I at least intrigued by him as an everyday third baseman? Yeah, I am. Same for Kyder Montero. If he keeps getting better and finally builds on his good starts instead of lacking consistency, he can find that consistency and put together good start after good start. How do I feel about him being in the starting rotation next season? I feel pretty good. So when it comes to a good finish, those are the things that I'm looking for on a case-by-case basis that I think actually matters. Because we saw last year, the Tigers finished strong as a team. But did anything they did down the stretch in their final 50 games significantly impact the plan for 2025? Not really. The plan still stayed the same. And that plan was to kind of shop at the, the bargain, you know, get a couple pitchers and, and try to kind of see what these young guys have. Earmark at bats for young players. We've heard that time and time again from President of Baseball Operations, Scott Harris. So again, the 29 and 21 record in the final 50 games last season didn't change a whole lot. That's kind of how I view it at this point. Well, let's kind of recap a little bit. I have a few things to chime in on this. And as usual, I will make people mad. So, you know, first I'll tell you, last year, last 29 games of the year, 19 and 10. Did it mean anything this year? <laughs> the damn thing. It actually meant absolutely zero. Tigers currently on a run of 23 and 18 in the last 41 games. I expect them to continue to play pretty well for the rest of the month. Got a very favorable schedule. They're going to camp out in Chicago all week against a mediocre team and a bad team. So hopefully they can continue on with the good karma. Things are going well. What does it mean? Well, to me, and I tweeted this last night, Gary Bonds Carpenter, Riley Green, Parker Meadows, Colt Keith, good catching tandem. That's your core right there. Those are the five players who are penciled in, guaranteed next year. Will Matt Veerling be on the team? Yeah, more than likely. Will Trey Sweeney be the shortstop? Mm, no. Will Jace Young be playing third base? Well, I watched him Saturday from a pretty beautiful seat, nine rolls behind the Yankee dugout. And if you watch baseball and your baseball people, and I was sitting next to one of the smartest baseball people I have ever known who taught me tons of stuff, who was a scout for Seattle and is a college baseball coach, and we watched him go behind the bag to field about third base, and he took the wrong angle, and he kind of had a mat arm. And those are things that baseball people look at. And so I hate to break it to all the Tiger fans who are just embracing the idea that Jay Young is a good defender at third base and he has potential over there. And my answer to you is, not really. So can he hit? Yeah. Do I think he'd be a good second baseman? Probably. Do I think they could play him there and he could fake it for a season and he wouldn't be the worst third baseman in baseball defensively? Yeah, but he'd be bottom 10%. So do I think Jay Young is probably better off put into a trade to get another asset that they can use more? A hundred percent. Okay. So you can be mad about it. You cannot like what I'm telling you. But yeah, Tigers have a core. They have a pretty interesting core of really interesting left-hand hitting players that'll start their year. They need some right-hand hitting players. They need a third baseman for sure that they should try to sign in free agency. And we'll talk about that about 10,000 times between now and December. But let's get on to question two of the big two, which is regarding everybody's favorite topic, Spencer Torkelson. So Spencer Torkelson returns Saturday from AAA Toledo. What's our expectations for him in the final six weeks? And can it change the dynamic of how the Tigers probably really feel about him? Yeah, I don't think it changes a whole lot of the dynamic, no matter what he does. I think he'd have to really go out there and perform, really rake, really stick to a game plan. And again, like you got to cut down on the strikeouts. It's kind of been a problem for him. It's been a big problem, actually, in in AAA Toledo. But I want to start first off by saying I'm super happy for Spencer Torres. Okay. Comes back to Comerica Park on Saturday for his first game as a Tiger since June 1st. He gets a standing ovation from the fans during pregame lineup introductions. And then what does he do? He goes out and hits a double and a triple, along with drawing a walk in his first game since being sent down to Triple A Toledo. That was a feel-good moment for Tigers fans. 
and a feel-good moment for Torkelson. This guy was the number one overall pick in 2020. He has failed miserably at the highest level on the biggest stage. Have that moment. It must have felt good. It was awesome for me to watch. I know it felt good for Spencer. As for expectations, I'm not expecting much from Torkelson because I haven't seen a big difference in his performance in AAA Toledo where he hit you know, just 239 with 11 home runs, 42 walks, 85 strikeouts in 58 games. He had a 30.9% strikeout rate. The strikeouts are a big concern moving forward. Despite other improvements, he had the positive takeaway of hitting 268 with an 840 OPS on fastballs that registered at least 93 miles an hour in AAA. Remember, against that same velocity, he hit 131 with a 430 OPS in the big leagues before the demotion. So he goes from hitting 131 to 268 against higher end velocity. That's good to see. The contact rate there has not changed. The the quality of contact has significantly improved against high velocity pitches. The bad news is the contact has gotten a lot worse against everything else. So he struggled against sliders when he was with the mud ends, hitting 197 with a 47% whiff rate. His expected batting average on sliders was actually way worse than his actual batting average of 197. That's a problem. Also concerning swing and miss issues against changeups. Torkelson said he didn't change his swing in Toledo, but he changed his approach. He's trying to stick to the game plan, which often for him calls hit the ball to the right center gap going the opposite way, as opposed to trying to pull the ball and hit pull side home runs to left field. He thinks that his natural power will take over if he sticks to that plan, which is something he struggled to do. Too often he would just sell out for pull side power rather than staying to right field, staying to the big part of the field. We'll see if that actually makes any difference. I'm not sold because it didn't change a whole lot in Toledo, but I appreciate his effort in sticking to the game plan. It's something the Tigers have been talking about Torkelson needing to do since the end of last season. There's also the element of the defense. He apparently worked on his defense with infield coordinator Billy Boyer. He's worth minus five defensive runs saved in 2024 and minus 19 defensive runs saved across his entire MLB career. That needs to change if he's not going to hit 250 with 30 home runs. I don't foresee either of those things happening. I also don't foresee the defense getting that much better. I don't think he ever becomes an above average defender. If anything, he becomes just an average defender at best, maybe not even. And then again, we've talked about this tons of times, Mark. Torgelson is a career 219 hitter with a 686 OPS. That's across 1,326 plate appearances in 325 games. He turns 25 in late August. This is his third chance to stick in the big leagues. Is he any better than those career-long numbers I just read off? Hitting 219 with a 686 OPS? I don't think so. We'll see. He's got a chance to prove it, but I'm not so sure that he's any better than those numbers right there, and that's why I don't know if he's really a part of the core moving forward. Well, I think you and I both advocated a few weeks ago for him to be recalled so we could get a bigger sample size of what he might do in the last two months of the season. We were hoping for close to 200 at-bats. Now we're going to be much closer to 100 to 110 at-bats, which tells you literally absolutely nothing. I think Spencer Torkelson, in many ways, is what he is. Is he a smart, intuitive baseball player, especially with a bat in his hand? Absolutely, which worries me even more because now we're three years into it, Most of the same problems that have existed since day one still exist now. So no matter how smart he is, he hasn't been able to consistently apply the fix to improve his performance and production on the field, aside from a four-month period, out of what will now become, if a baseball season is six months long, which it is 26 weeks, he has now been, he will complete the year with 78 weeks of potential big league time and about 12 weeks of that time has been good. So you tell me, do you want to trust that going into 2025 when your window starts dissipating, when you have Scoobs with two more years left and Riley with three more years left? And, you know, you can't keep wasting these years of your best players and make no mistake about it. The three best, pl- the four best players on the Tigers are Kerry Bonds, Carpenter, Riley Gray, Tarek Skubal, and Colt Keith. And you cannot waste their service time giving me the story that you have guys in high A that are going to be here in two more years. These guys are going to be gone. So 
either you better try to be good next year or you just wasted a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of draft choices in player development, a pipe dream. So is Spencer Torkelson part of that mix? It's difficult for me to say yes to that. And if he is part of that mix, you better get a heck of a lot better backup first baseman for Spencer Torkelson than you had this year. Do I think Justin Henry Malloy could duplicate Spencer Torkelson's numbers? I think he can exceed them. Do I think he'd be a worse defensive first baseman having never played first base? Absolutely not. Spencer Torkelson, by metric, any metric you want, has been one of the three worst fielding first basemen for three straight years. And I laughed last night when that pop-up fell that people actually did not think that was his fault because people, there's 30 first basemen in the major leagues. 28 of them would have caught it. And this is the same issue that's been going on for three years. We don't want to discuss about ground balls to his right. Yeah, he's great at scooping baseballs. Tremendous. But there's a lot more to playing first base than scooping baseballs. Do I have confidence that Spencer Torkelson is a piece of their core? Absolutely not. Do I think he'll be the starting first baseman in 2025? Maybe 50-50. So that's my rant about it. I'm sure it upsets people. But facts are facts. You know, don't ever let facts get in the way of a good story. Mark, I think it's justified. I think it's justified because Scott Harris is going to have a decision to make this offseason on how he wants to move forward. You talk about contingency plans or do you just move on entirely? You know, if Spencer Torkelson brings it, he turns it on. I think you're looking at more of a contingency plan, kind of like I mentioned, the Keston Hero type or Carlos Santana, however they want to go about doing it. But look, if Spencer Torkelson is going to be same old Spencer Torkelson here down the stretch in these final six weeks, I, I think it's almost got to close the book on having him as a part of the core, as a part of the future. And maybe he just stays in Toledo, plays a ton of the game at first base, and you know you, you see if he's ever able to find it again. But I don't think you can count on him going into next season if he does not light the world on fire in these final six weeks, both with underlying data and with the performance on the back of the baseball card. Like Those are two things that he would have to do to really be a part of the plans for 2025. I'm right there with you. I think it's probably 50-50 because it depends on the direction of the Tigers. If they're targeting 2026 as their window to start winning, then maybe Spencer Torkelson is a part of the opening day roster in 2025. But if they're serious about winning now, and if they're serious about winning in 2025, I don't know how you can justify putting Spencer Torkelson on the opening day roster in 2025. Love the guy. Would love to see him perform and succeed. He's a nice human being. And, and again, like he's, it, things feel right. Like when you're in the clubhouse and Spencer Torkelson is there, the team feels complete. But on the field, he's just not getting it done. So I don't know how you could have him a part of the 2025 plans. If I don't know how you count, I, I don't know how you can count on him if he's going to be same old Spencer Torkelson. So I guess time will tell, but it's a decision Scott Harris is going to have to make this offseason. All right. Quickly, you know what the easiest position on the baseball field to find league average production? And especially if you wanted to, tolerate a right-hand hitter first base easiest place to find a guy all right let's take a break when we come back we're going to talk about jay shun trey sweeney all the other call-ups what's going on we'll be back in 60 all right carrie carpenter returned last tuesday from the injured list after three games on a rehab assignment, he spent 78 days on the injured list, list with a lumbar spine stress fracture. Not fun. Then hit two homers in his first game back, just like a Disney movie. How much of a difference maker is Kerry Bonds Carpenter? Pretty much everybody's favorite guy. Yeah, he's a huge difference maker. Kerry Bonds Carpenter was channeling his inner J.D. Martinez when he hit those home runs coming back from the injured list. Here's my favorite Kerry Bonds stat, okay? There are 292 players with at least 160 plate appearances against right-handed pitchers. Carpenter ranks 7th with a 998 OPS, trailing only Aaron Judge, Shohei Otani, Rafael Devers, Kyle Tucker, Juan Soto, and Bobby Witt Jr. And on that list, he is ahead of Marcelo Zuna, Gunnar Henderson, Freddie Freeman, Corey Seager, Brent Rooker, Christian Yelich, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Jordan Alvarez, Mookie Betts, Eli De La Cruz, Bryce Harper. I can go on and on and on with big name superstars. Kerry Carpenter is better than most of them. 
when it comes to hitting against right-handed pitching. He is an absolute difference maker in the middle of the Tigers lineup. Fastballs up, secondary pitches down. Sure, those can get him to whiff, but he doesn't miss pitches on the inner third or over the heart of the plate. And when he makes contact, he does some serious damage. We can't forget that Kerry Carpenter was playing the best baseball of his life before he got injured. He played his final game May 26th before spending two months on the injured list with lumbar spine stress fracture. Before the injury, Carpenter was hitting 368 with three home runs and a 1.458 OPS in eight games. He felt like he was absolutely locked in because he was. And then he spends 78 days on the injured list and he picks up right where he leaves off with two home runs and a three-hit performance on Tuesday, a clutch home run in the eighth inning Wednesday, both against the Mariners. Not only one hit in his past three games, but Kerry Carpenter is able to break out with power at any moment. He's dangerous, and he's back. It feels really good. Look, Evan Petzold and Mark Gorash, never really too fanboy about too many players. But let's be honest, we both love Kerry Bonds Carpenter. We love the damage. We love the fun. We love the consistency. And we love the story. He, 19th round pick to a legit dude. Eh, the boy rakes. Come on. I mean, talk about J.D. Martinez, two of, you know, a, a player that both of us have much love for. And Kirk Bonds Carpenter has a lot of J.D.M. in him, except he hits left-handed and faces way more opposite side <laughs> advantageous pitching because he hits left-handed. So, yeah, we love us some Kerry Bonds Carpenter. Keep getting it in the jet stream towards right. And uh, let's hope he stays healthy for the rest of the year. All right, let's get to uh, some of these call-ups, discuss them, give some opinion about what we've seen in the first few days. Third baseman Jay Shung was promoted Friday from Triple A Toledo. Let's talk about him. Give us the background and give us some of your early thoughts. Yeah, Jace Young, the number 12 overall pick in the 2022 draft out of Texas Tech. He ranks as the Tigers' number five prospect and MLB's number 64 prospect. According to MLB Pipeline, the Tigers called him up with 44 days remaining in the 2024 season, which means John will keep his rookie status for the 2025 season. He'll also stay eligible for rookie awards, which could net the Tigers draft picks because he is a top 100 prospect on several lists. He gets to keep his rookie eligibility as long as he doesn't exceed 130 at-bats in the final 40 games. The threshold for maintaining rookie status is no more than 45 games on an active roster which is why the Tigers waited until there were 44 days, that's days, not games, left in the season to call him up. Now, again, it's, it's such a small sample size, but so far so good at third base, so far so good at the plate, swinging in good pitches. He's drawn three walks and 12 trips to the plate. He hasn't really gotten to the, gotten the ball in the air at all. Lots of ground balls, slow on the bases. Again, small sample size. I can't wait to watch him for a full week in Chicago against the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox. That's my quick evaluation from you know the three games that Jace Young has played in the big leagues. I think we need to dig into what he did in Toledo to really get a full grasp of who he is. He hit 257 with 14 home runs, 67 walks, and 93 strikeouts in 91 games, posting an 831 OPS. He's a left-handed hitter who is much better against right-handed pitching, but he's shown that he can defend himself against left-handed pitching. The Tigers transitioned Young from second base to third base in the Arizona Fall League to accommodate for Cole Keefe needing to play second base. Remember, Cole Keefe suffered a shoulder injury earlier in his career that requires him to stay at second base or possibly move to first base. But for now, if it's the infield and it's going to be non-first base, he's got to stay at second base. So the Tigers move Jace Young to third base to accommodate Cole Keefe. Tigers don't want Cole Keefe making those long throws from third base with the shoulder issue in the past. It was 12 errors in 65 games for Jace at third base in Toledo. He's a better second baseman, but unless the Tigers move Keith to first base, Jace Young has no choice but to play third. He suffered a right wrist injury in June, spent 19 days on the injured list from June 20th to July 8th. After recovering, he hit 229 with a 706 OPS in his final 27 games in AAA Toledo. Before the injury, he hit 270 with an 890 OPS in 64 games. So he was much better before the wrist injury and then struggled afterwards. It was interesting. He struggled against off-speed pitches and high-velocity fastballs. I thought he did a good job of laying off sliders in Toledo and other breaking balls. But against changeups and high-velocity fastballs, those were kind of the problem areas for him. He hit 197 with a 34.8% whiff rate on fastballs that registered at least 95 miles an hour. So I'm watching for how does he do against changeups down in the zone 
and high velocity fastballs that are up and away, I think that's going to tell me a lot about what kind of hitter Jace Young can eventually be. If he's able to lay off of those pitches or he's able to fight them off, that's a really good sign because I like the plate discipline right now. He's going to draw his walks. The question is going to be how much contact is he going to make at the big league level and how much contact in the air is he going to make to try to tap into some of that home run power that we've seen in the minor leagues. I have to admit, watching his approach, watching his swing execution so far, it's early. I've liked everything I've seen. I, I like to use a, a term called hitting aptitude. Jay Sean has some hitting aptitude. He can vary his approach based on the circumstances. I think you saw that last night in the, in the, in the ninth inning. And uh, knew what to do, knew where to go, had a plan, executed it. It's a, it, you know, obviously the highest leverage point of the game. Kind of, in a weird way, is a Colt Keith Light. Maybe a little more pull side power a little less capacity to purely hit, but they're kind of similar players. Both will draw a pretty decent amount of walks, probably hit over 20 homers, probably are both second basemen. You know, Jay Shung's not a not a third baseman unless some dramatic improvements occur. I just don't think he has the arm or the footwork to play there in the major leagues. I really don't. But wouldn't be shocked if Scott Harris, you know, just – wants to stubbornly play there. I'm sure there'll be a lot of talk about it in October in Lakeland when he and AJ sit down and AJ says, yeah, I need you to buy me one of these third basemen. That's a free agent. Mm. Scott says, I want to go with Jay Young. And, you know, I'm sure Chris Illich will have to get involved a little bit there because I got a feeling AJ is just finally getting a little frustrated about wanting to win and, you know, having somebody that wants to be the smartest guy in the room and have a $70 million payroll. But we'll see how that works out. we got plenty of time to talk about it. But kind of like the swings I'm seeing, the hitting aptitude, you know, should be a fun 40 days to see what else he can do. And hopefully he does well enough that he improves his trade value and we can swap for something that we need more. All right. There was another promotion that that's going to get a lot of playing time. Shortstop Trey Sweeney. Came up from Toledo Friday night. Had been hot as a firecracker since July 1st. First month at Oklahoma City, then absolutely torched the International League for about 50 at-bats. He, we've only seen him for three games. I'm curious what your impression is and, you know, cover a little bit of the background with Trey Sweeney. Yeah, Trey Sweeney was the number 20 overall pick in the 2021 draft. Selected by the Yankees, then traded to the Dodgers in, Sept- in December 2023 and then traded to the Tigers in the Jack Flaherty trade with Byron Lorenzo at the 2024 trade deadline here just recently at the end of July. He's ranked as the number 20 prospect in the Tigers organization. And when the Tigers got him, he became red hot immediately in AAA Toledo, hitting 381 with two home runs, five walks, and 12 strikeouts in 11 games, posting a 1.114 OPS. He also had a 500 batting average on balls in play. League average is around 300. It's actually down a little bit from there this season, around like 295. So yeah, he was getting pretty lucky on his balls in play. Like that is going to come down. He's not going to hit three. He's not going to hit 400. He wasn't going to hit 400 all season in Toledo, but the Tigers decided to give him some runway, you know, calling him up. He struggles against left-handed pitchers. He's a left-handed hitter. He performs better against righties. Probably won't see as much playing time against lefty pitchers as guys like Cole Keith and Jace Young just because I think the struggles against lefties for Trey Sweeney are real, real. I don't think he can defend himself as well as Jace Young and Colt Keith obviously thrives against lefties. He's fine. But before the trade to the Tigers, Sweeney hit 255 with a 761 OPS. Remember, he was performing worse than ex-Tiger Andre Lipschius in AAA Oklahoma City across the entire season. That's in the Dodgers organization. That should give you a hint at Sweeney's actual potential when it comes to what things look like on offense. We'll see what he ends up becoming and what he can develop into. But Trey Sweeney, Andre Lipschius, Andre Lipschius performing better. That kind of tells you something for Tigers fans who know a little bit about Andre Lipschius. Two big league games so far, four strikeouts and seven plate appearances. He looks a little bit overmatched, lots of two strike counts. You hate to see that. Every ball in play has been on the ground. He's had problems figuring out the optimal ground ball slash fly ball ratio throughout his minor league career with both the Yankees and the Dodgers. I'll be interested to see how the Tigers try to optimize him because he does hit the ball hard. Super small sample but 94.4 mile an hour average exit velocity on balls in play. Hits the ball hard, but it seems like hard contact on the ground. That's not a good recipe for success. 
We do need to talk about his defense, though. I heard from a few people coming off the trade that Sweeney didn't project as an everyday shortstop in the big leagues, that he would eventually settle into a strong side of the platoon utility role as a second baseman, a third baseman. So far, I've been pretty impressed with his defense at shortstop. He makes all the plays, looks confident, moves quickly while staying under control. I know it's a small sample, but I think he has above average shortstop instincts, even if he isn't a plus defender based on the skill set. Another guy I can't wait to see for a full week in Chicago. I'm not sold on the bat, but the defense has impressed me more than I thought it would. I think that's a good thing for the Tigers. The more shortstops they can have in their system that can play there, the better. And we'll see who ends up rising to the top with the bat. Liked his arm when I saw it Saturday. Better arm than I thought. Think it'll play at third base as well as short and second. Didn't love the footwork. Pretty decent glove hand. Have noticed watching how he's been pitched, really struggling with pitches down in the zone. I mean, struggling enough to make a contact on him, and they were pounding him there at bat after at bat after at bat. Be interested to see what happens this week in Chicago. I'm a little intrigued with Trey Sweeney. I just need to see if he can make some adjustments in how he's being pitched and if he can get the ball in the air a little bit. I think it's pretty much that simple. Um you know, which leads me into about a 30 second discussion of something I wanted to touch on with you, which is last 60 at bats of Javi Baez is close to a 900 OPS with six homers. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. You got, you got any, any thoughts on that one for me there, Chief? You've been watching this for close to three years, and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Mark, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Javi Baez is performing well. That's a good thing. Like, it's always a good thing when Javi Baez is doing something. What does it mean for the long term? I don't know. It might mean absolutely nothing. We need to see it in a much, much, much larger sample size, top on the Javi Baez train again. But no, it's always good to see him having success. Like, as much as people say, you know, oh, Javi Baez sucks. And like, sure, like the numbers indicate that he does. You know, he's done a really good job of staying true to the team. He's done a good job of handling his day-to-day. He's working. He's grinding. He's trying new things. Like, Javi Baez is a good team guy. Like, if anybody thinks that he's not, they're wrong. They haven't been in the clubhouse. They haven't seen what he's like. Javi Baez is a good dude. He's someone that, like, you want him to have success because you see the work that he's putting in. You see how hard he's grinding. And also, like, you understand there is a level of embarrassment for a guy who used to be at the top of the game and has now fallen off so significantly. He's embarrassed. Like, he wants to play well. And so to see him have some good moments, like the big home run against Andres Munoz. I mean, my goodness, Andres Munoz, the, the, the closer for the Mariners, has just been absolutely lights out all season long. Javi gets a slider that he can hit, and he drives it out and hits it for a home run in, in a clutch moment. That was awesome. Like, that was awesome to see because those things don't happen very often. And, and from a humanistic level, like, you love seeing that from a guy who's been grinding so much over the last three seasons. Am I buying in? Absolutely not. But is it fun to see? Yeah, it's cool. It's cool to see Javi buy his ball out. That That's always fun. That was a lot of fun, man. You 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 wish for good things for Javi. He's he's taken a lot of abuse. He's kept his mouth shut, kept grinding, and it would have been easy to, you know, behave differently. But he's he stayed with it, and I appreciate that he's done that. All right, outfield outfielder Riley Green returned Sunday from the injured list for the Little League Classic after two games in Toledo. Your thoughts for the remainder of the year for Riley, how much DH, how much outfield, and what do you expect to see in the swing? Yeah, so welcome back. Riley Green coming back from a right hamstring strain. He went 0 for 4 with two strikeouts in the Little League Classic, but nobody's worried about Riley Green. He'll come through eventually. It was just good to see him back with the Tigers for the first time since July 25th. Played in two games for Toledo, went 1 for 6 in six plate appearances. He played both games in left field. When he came back for the Little League Classic, he served as the designated hitter. It's great to have him back, first off. Like, we got to start there because this is a guy who's an all star for the first time this season, hitting 261 with 17 home runs, 51 walks, 111 strikeouts, and 102 games in his third MLB season. His 833 OPS ranks 21st among 140 qualified batters. That's in the Jaron Duran, Anthony Santander, Alec Baum, Ellie De La Cruz, Jordan Westberg range of players. For me, a successful final six weeks of the season is simply staying healthy. He has a history of leg injuries, needs to stay on the field, needs to stay off the injury list, and needs to get to the offseason as fast as possible. And to get there, the Tigers are going to have him in the DH spot a ton. He'll play some outfield, he'll play some DH, Kerry Carpenter, same way. 
some outfield, some DH. They got to keep both those guys healthy. When you talk about the core, it's again, Parker Meadows, Colt Keith, Riley Green, Kerry Carpenter. I know you got Dylan Dingler at catcher, but but just focusing on those four position players, right? Like that is the core. That is the core of the Tigers moving forward. And and you got to keep the two of those guys that are injury prone. You've got to keep them healthy. You have to keep them healthy. And I think that starts with giving them some time at DH, giving them time in the in the outfield, and also giving them off days. And you know AJ Hinch is going to strategically pick the off days. We saw him, you know, do that with Kerry Carpenter. You know when the Tigers were in and Parker Meadows too. With Parker Meadows coming back from the hamstring injury. We saw him do that when the Yankees had Carlos Rodon on the mound here at Comerica Park, sitting both of those guys to just give them a chance to catch their breath and to make sure they can take care of their bodies because the Tigers need to keep them healthy. And they got to get into the offseason so they can have them in 2025. Because, man, when those guys are all playing, they're difference makers. You've got to have them healthy. Yeah. You know, just watching last night, even though he didn't do too much from a productivity level, the swings had just a lot more violence in them that right when he went on the injured list he was not swinging great those last few days and mark those swings were all upper body when he before he went to the injury i mean they were just upper body throwing his arms at the ball like there there were no legs there was no strength in those swings it's just different now yeah he he was he had the damage swing last night so might take him a couple of at bats to get some timing back but i expect riley green to be riley green and i expect him to finish you know, doing 800 to 1,000 OPS kind of things here in these last 125, 138 bats. I'm excited to have him back. Player we both are pretty fond of and uh, just stay healthy. All right. Justin Henry Malloy, not Zach McKinstry, was optioned to Triple A Toledo after the Little League Classic, getting the roster back to 26 players. And I think both of us have advocated for. Sick McKinstry to be gone, but I think if you watch the lineup the last 60 days, and I tweeted this a few days ago, Zach McKinstry was going nowhere. Uh, A.J. Hinch was playing him for a reason. Obviously, A.J. Hinch has a lot of comfort level with Zach McKinstry. Zach McKinstry actually has had a really great last two weeks. J. Hen demoted. Don't think he'll be down there long. Let's kind of go over his 60-game, two-month trial in the big leagues, and give me your impressions. Yeah, so I think going back to Zach McKinstry just really quick, he can do a lot of different things for you. Yes, it's another left-handed bat. It would be great if he was a right-handed hitter, but at the same time, he plays third base, shortstop, second base, left field, right field. He can do a lot of different things, whereas Justin Henry Malloy is very, very one-dimensional as a DH-only type player who, yes, plays some left field, but it's a bad left field that he plays. He's a DH. So yeah, like the Tigers and Yankees, they were allowed to have a 27th player for the Little League Classic, which the Tigers used to reinstate Riley Green from the injured list. But that meant that a player had to be optioned before Tuesday's series opener against the Cubs at Wrigley Field. So after Sunday's game, the Tigers optioned Malloy to AAA Toledo. He's already played in 181 games in Toledo, combined between 2023 and 2024. He's no stranger to the Mud Hens. He's got nothing else really to prove in the International League, but the Tigers sent him out and they decided to keep Zach McKinstry, among other players, on the roster. Malloy hit 217 with eight home runs, 21 walks, and 74 strikeouts in 57 games with the Tigers, posting a 698 OPS. He could return as soon as September 1st, when rosters expand from 26 players to 28 players. He made his big league debut in June. Here are the things I liked about Justin Henry Malloy. Above average 10% walk rate, an elite 19% chase rate, great teammate, fantastic human being, good knowledge of the strike zone. He really knows the zone. And that's a good thing. That's a great first step for any hitter in the big leagues. But things that I did not like about Malloy, designated hitter only, bad defense in left field, below average exit velocities, terrible whiff rate at 36%. That That's a big problem. Terrible strikeout rate at 36%. He didn't chase bad pitches, but he also didn't make enough in-zone contact. And when he did chase, by the way, he barely made out-of-zone contact. It's just not enough contact for me. The bat flashes some pop, but if you're not going to make contact, you're not going to hit enough. That's my problem with Malloy. It's too many strikeouts, not enough hits, and bad defense. I think that there is like a build there, though, of a good power hitter who maybe never hits above 250, but is going to run into 20 to 25 home runs as a designated hitter, or maybe as a first baseman if they give him the glove. 
But I do think there's going to have to be some type of swing changes just to make more contact because he's not making enough contact. You can't have a 36% whiff rate and expect to thrive in the big leagues without a ton of power, like massive power. Like you have to have, like, like you have to have 30 homer power off the bat if you're going to be able to, and he has to develop into that a little bit more. I don't like that. I don't think that he's going to hit enough, make enough contact. And also, again, like the exit velocities just like weren't great. So I'm a little bit more cold on Justin Henry Malloy than you are, I think. But um, again, I think it's justified based on the data and he can change my mind. He can change my mind with better production. Let's recap how I feel about it, which is prior to his recall, never a huge J. Hen guy. Too many holes in too many places. However, after watching him for two months, I tip my cat to him, hat to him. Here's why. <clears throat> Last 138 plate appearances, 252, 333, 447. Not exactly a small sample size. 10.2 walk rate, 121 WRC+. plus. You know what? It's pretty solid damn production on a team that really doesn't hit well. Mark, Does I disagree completely. It's a, it's, a, it's a sub 600 OPS in his last 21 games. Like, pick your sample size. I, I, I get it. You know, numbers are fun, especially when we're talking about a two-month period of time because lots of variances. But what I do like about Jahan, he grew as a hitter. He adapted. He has a lot of hitting aptitude, especially in big spots. He seemed to understand how to dial back his power and go for a base hit, especially to the right side of second base. Did it multiple times. I think there's a lot there. He reminds me weirdly of a player who struggled a ton early, got let go by Minnesota, ended up on Oakland. It has pretty much been one of the 20 best hitters in baseball this year. Brent Rooker, go look it up. So am I excited about Jay Hen? No. Do I see something in there? Yeah, kind of. That's fair. Know. I agree. No, that's fair. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to say goodbye to a veteran and talk about the beautiful stylings and polishing of Cater Montero. We'll be back. All right, we're back. Tigers. DFA Gio Urshela was cleared waivers, was a pretty fun player, kind of at the tail end of his productivity. Not much to say here. What's your thoughts? Yeah, it was an all right run for Gio Urshela. Signed a one-year, $1.5 million contract in spring training. Designated for assignment before Friday's game to help make room for Jace Young and Trey Sweeney on the 40-man roster. Tigers are going to eat the final 353000 of the $1.5 million salary. No big deal at all. He hit 243 with five home runs, 19 walks, 49 strikeouts in 92 games, worth minus five defensive runs saved at third base. I thought he was a little bit better than that based on the eye test. He was nothing more than a placeholder on a dirt cheap contract. No trade inch deadline. He had that memorable walk-off home run July 13th for an 11-9 win over the Dodgers, capping an epic comeback. Also had two home runs and a three-game stretch in early June at Fenway Park. Spent the time on the injured list. That's about it. That was Gio Rochella in a nutshell for the Tigers this season. I'm excited to see Jace Young get reps at third base. It was about time to say farewell to Gio Rochella, and now the Tigers have. Yeah, it was about time to say bye to Gio Rochella about six weeks ago, but okay. All right, so let's talk about something a lot more fun. Peter Montero, as we kind of had hoped and had discussed a few times previous to Saturday, is polishing what he does well. He's learning a lot of Reese Olsen 2023 vibes through five scoreless innings on two hits, two walks with five strikeouts Saturday. Tell me what you're seeing and, you know, what's the vibe in the clubhouse and how are people feeling about it? It's awesome, man. you got to love seeing this guy succeed. Cater Montero came up and he took his lumps early, but the stuff has always been there. Fastball slider, curveball changeup sinker. Fastball gets hit around the most, but when he locates, he has his best starts. Slider gets whiffs and weak contact. He loves the curveball. I don't know if the curveball is actually a better pitch than the slider. Then there's a changeup. That's been a work in progress pitch. He used it to try to strike out Juan Soto in the third inning of Saturday's game. That was a big sign of progress for me with Montero. It's the development of that changeup to get left-handed hitters out. The Juan Soto story is just incredible. 
Juan Soto gets in the box. He does the Soto shuffle to try to intimidate Cater Montero, and he stares him down. And this is a, a, a guy who's been around the league and is one of the best hitters in all of baseball, staring down this rookie who's got like a five-plus ERA. And Juan Soto stares down Cater Montero. Well, what does Montero do? He doesn't look away. He stares back at Juan Soto. And he gives him that death stare, like, you're not going to intimidate me. And then he strikes out Juan Soto on four pitches, finishing him off with the changeup. And he has this moment of, like, swagger where it's like, okay, like, I just struck out Juan Soto after he stared me down, after he did his shuffle, where he kind of moves back and forth, and he gets in that low crouch, tries to intimidate the pitcher, and and Cater Montero struck him out. And that was his favorite moment of Saturday's game, which was really impressive because he also struck out Aaron Judge. He received a standing ovation from the fans after five scoreless innings. A lot of good signs from Cater Montero. When he is commanding all of his pitches in the zone, he, he he's unhittable. Like you can't hit him when he's throwing all of his pitches in the zone and locating them where he wants to. For me, it starts with the fastball because that's the most hittable pitch. He's doing a good job of hiding it, keeping it disguised, just like Reese Olsen, where the fastball is the most hittable pitch, but he does a good job of disguising it with the secondary pitches. The changeup, though, like if he can get that changeup down, he can have the slider going one way, the changeup going the other way, and he can use those pitches to his advantage while hiding the fastball. Anything is possible for Cater Montero. We could see, yes, Reese Olsen caliber production out of him. A lot of good signs, but he has a long way to go. He needs to be consistent in his good performances. I want to see him build start after start after start, as opposed to having one good start, three bad starts, one good start, two bad starts one good start, three bad starts. Like I, I want to see some consistency as he's building. We're going to find out a lot more about him in the final six weeks of the season. But right now, I'm pretty excited about him. I think if he finishes strong, I feel really good going into 2025 as him being a member of the starting rotation. Consistency, Evan Petzl, 3-1, 352 ERA in August. Pretty damn good. Not exactly pitching against terrible teams either. So a lot to like about Keter Montero, you think he's a lock for the rotation in 2025 or he's going to have to compete for the five spot? I think he's going to have to compete. I don't think they're going to come into it giving him that spot. I mean, look, if Reese Olsen came into spring training, you know, without his spot locked in, he had to earn it. I think Keter Montero has to earn it too, but he's definitely on the right track. And again, you mentioned the consistency with what he's done in August. He has to keep doing it. He's got to keep building on it. I think he has a chance to be really special but he's got to keep putting it all together. And for me, a lot of it is with the changeup. Let's see if he can continue to develop that pitch. I think he's got a chance, and I think he's got a good shot to not only be you know, a fifth starter, but maybe even like a four starter or even a three starter when you look at the profile of what he can become. Time will tell, but I like what I'm seeing so far. All right, quick insert here. Curious if you're hearing if Reese Olsen is going to start throwing bullpens this week and what his chances are of throwing it all in September. Yeah, I don't know if he's going to be coming back at all in September. I think maybe the plan might be to just rehab him up and get him healthy. Certainly, Reese Olsen hasn't closed the door on that, and I haven't heard the Tigers close the door on that the same way that they haven't closed the door on a Wenzel Perez return, but we'll see. I mean, again, it's still been flat ground throwing, increasing the volume and the distance. The next step for him is probably going to be a bullpen, but again, he just kind of starts to run out of time in the season when you look at you know, finishing things off in you know late September. September 29th is the final game of the season. You know, you look at a rehab assignment coming back from a shoulder strain. Like, you really don't want to, you know, put the foot on the gas there. Maybe the Tigers have him ready and rehabbing just in case there is a postseason run. It's a 1.1% chance right now. But in case that 1.1% chance hits for some odd reason, maybe he's able to be back in time for something like that. But I think for as of right now, it's not looking great, but you never know. Tigers haven't closed the book on it. Reese Olsen hasn't closed the book on it. So I'm not going to either. Not yet, at least. How about some Matt Manning bullpen outings? Yeah, we'll see. Got to get, I mean, he's he's a guy too who like, we'll see if he's able to actually make a comeback and he's actually able to to pitch again. And we'll see how long that takes him. Like, this is a right lat strain. That's pretty significant. Throwing three times per week is one thing. Getting built up enough to throw multiple bullpens and to throw live BPs and to go into a rehab assignment. Those things take time, and a lat strain is not something that you want to rush either. So when you're looking at shoulders and lats, it's a little bit different than a hamstring strain, if you will. So I, I think that's why I'm more cautiously optimistic about those guys, maybe even a little bit more pessimistic about their chances of actually returning. All right, let's talk about something that's fun. Tyler Holton absolutely shoving for so long that it seems like he has given up a run in forever, actually. 
one or run the last 29 innings. Give us a little feedback on that. You mentioned doing it forever, and it feels like it has been forever because over the past two seasons, he's pitched in 156 innings in 170 games in 2023 and 2024. He's got a 2.31 ERA in 156 innings in 2023 and 2024. He has been doing it for forever. Got a 5.2% walk rate, a 22% strikeout rate, gets the ball on the ground at an above average rate, about 45% both in 2023 and 2024. All of his data is pretty much the same between the two seasons, and his production has been the same between the past two seasons. That's rare, and it's impressive. He ranks first in ERA among all pitchers with at least 150 innings in the past two seasons, which is a group of just 145 pitchers. He's also tied for first with Blake Snell in opponent batting average at 183 over the past two seasons among pitchers with at least 150 innings in the past two seasons. It's incredible what he's been able to do. I absolutely love it. He can do it all, too. He can start games. He can close games. He can pitch at extra innings. He can get you three innings in the middle of the game to bridge the gap. Tyler Holden can do whatever you ask, whenever you ask. And uh, there's something special about the way he goes about it. He's got a ton of different pitches. He locates them all. He's fun, man. He's a really fun pitcher. When you see him step up in big moments and strike out Juan Soto and Aaron Judge, you kind of sit back and you're like, damn, this guy's legit because he is. And he's been doing it for two years now. Got to give credit where credit's due. You can't stop Tyler Holden. By far, and when I say by far, I mean by far the best Scott Harris acquisition, to say the least. Agree, disagree? Agree. Okay. All right. Lastly, quickly, I'm curious your thoughts on uh, how close the Tigers are to contending in the AL Central. It's a pretty damn good division, you know, shockingly, and it's probably going to get better next year. So, what do you think? Yeah, it's interesting you asked the question because there's a lot of buzz about the Tigers being ranked as the number six farm system by MLB Pipeline in the midseason update. Let's not forget a couple of things. The Tigers were number two in baseball in the 2020 midseason and the 2021 preseason rankings. They were also number seven in the 2021 midseason and number 10 in the 2022 preseason. So we've been here before, people, where the Tigers had a very highly rated farm system. Another thing we can't forget is that on the latest farm system rankings, which again, make what you will of farm system rankings, probably not a whole lot, but if you're going to boast about the Tigers being number six, let's not forget that the Twins ranked number two and the Guardians ranked number four. Those teams are already good and they're only going to get better. So you got the Twins and the Guardians better than the Tigers currently. They got two and four on that list of 30 teams in the farm system rankings. The Tigers are not as good as those two teams and they're coming in at number six. So make of that what you will. As for the actual question, I think the Tigers are still two years away from competing in the AL Central. I've said it before, I'll say it again, 2026 at the earliest, 2027 is the target date. That's what I think the timeline is for Scott Harris, even though Scott Harris won't provide a timeline to anyone, which is super annoying, but it is what it is. Let's not forget about how good the Twins and Royals have been. Okay, I know we talked about the Guardians having a highly rated farm system. They're at the top of the division. The Twins and the Royals have been great this year, and they're not even at the top of the division. Twins started... 7-13, and they have a 63-41 and record across their last 104 games. That's a 98-win pace since their bad start. The Royals are riding a four-game winning streak. They lead the AL Central with a positive 109 run differential, which ranks second in the AL and second in MLB behind only the Yankees. And then you have the Guardians at the top of the division with first-year manager and Stephen Vogt. They're on pace for 94 wins this season. The Tigers still have work to do, people. They still have work to do. 2026 is the early day for me. And we'll see if they can make it happen. Twins, one game behind the Guardians right now. The Twins are quite good. All right, it's time for us to get out of here. I'm not going to comment on how competitive we're going to be in 2025. We only have another eight months to discuss that, including all winter. And I'm sure we will. I'd like to remind everybody to uh, rate, share, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Of course, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, The Ethos. And you can always find us embedded in every single Evan Petzold article at thefreep.com. I'd like to thank our free press editor, Nicole Avery Nichols, our producer, the magic man, Robin Chan, who saves us every week. Love them a grandson, the spectacular Braden Michael Gorosh. And shout out, as always, to the beautiful Savannah Petzold, who's going to have to endure her man going on the road to Chicago this week. To everybody... 
I'd like to say, fun week. Peace. Peace.